a great uh, privilege for me uh, to uh, uh, be invited to do this Adam Smith uh, lecture. Uh, Adam Smith, of course, is uh, uh, every economist uh, hero. Uh, yesterday, I uh, was able to, uh, to, to, to look at the first edition of uh, uh, Wealth of Nations, uh, Adam Smith's uh, uh, most famous uh, books related to economics with uh, Professor, uh, Professor Ding. I guess uh, I realized I sh sh probably should have title my talk is an inquiry into the, what is it, the effects and causes of China's growth. <laughs> but, you know, similar, uh, similar um, uh, meaning. Now, uh, to, just to remind ourselves how unusual Chinese growth is, let me start with a graph that, that does not have uh, China. So this actually appears in BBC uh, News, uh, online version, two days ago. It describes essentially how uh, you know, many of the uh, advanced countries, including European countries, have been doing uh, between 2009 and 2018, essentially recovery of the crisis, not about crisis itself. Uh, and, you know, the you know, lists, uh, you know, the top performer uh, is uh, Sweden, uh, which has, a, ha has had a cumulative growth of GDP by 20% from 2009 to, to last year, 2018. All right, so it lists many other countries. So Czech Republic is doing uh, pretty well, not as well as Sweden, United States, and so on. And then, the, so the scale on the, on the vertical axis is from minus 30 to 20. Then you have countries like Greece, the terrible rate. Cumulative growth rates are in, uh, this is per capita disposal income, income was a drop by 30%. Italy, Spain, or Austria also had a negative uh, drop. So that's kind of a scale of, uh, of uh, what happened to people's, uh, average person's disposable income over this 10-year uh, uh, period. During the same 11-year uh, ele period, during the same 11-year 11, 11 period, an average Chinese citizen's real disposable income, inflation-adjusted disposable income, roughly doubled. Uh, uh, number one and number, number two, uh, as a result, if you look at inequality, among all citizens of the world. So nowadays, inequality is a big topic because in many national economies, inequality has been risen. But inequality for the world as a whole has shrunk to a large degree because the Chinese uh, disposable income has been growing so fast because the Chinese citizens started from very low base uh, and the very rapid rise uh, of relatively poor part of the, of, the, of the globe makes global inequality smaller. Uh, and uh, in fact, if you look at the, uh, you know, contribution to global GDP growth, country by country, China is the largest single country contributor to global GDP growth and has been so since 2001. A given country's uh, contribution to GDP growth uh, depends on two things. One is what is the share of the country in global GDP. The other is what is the national real GDP growth, right? And com com you know, the product of these two compared to uh, overall global GDP growth give you uh, any country's contributions. Uh, in last year, for example, uh, uh, China accounts for uh, slightly less than 19% uh, of global GDP and contributes uh, uh, contributes, uh, contributed about 27% of glo global GDP uh, compared to uh, roughly half of that from the United States. U U.S. is slightly bigger, but much lower growth rate, so the product of the two is smaller than, than, than Chinese. Uh, with relatively high uh, likelihood, you know, China will, is an uh, engine for global growth and will remain uh, to be so. Uh, in the foreseeable, uh, foreseeable future. So that's just a you know, quick way to think about uh, you know, what has happened to China, uh, Chinese growth uh, so far. Now, of course, lately, much of the talk is about moderation of Chinese growth. And you can, you can get pictures like this uh, from uh, you know, various uh, corners. Here, I just happen to take two cover photos from two different issues of Economist magazine. You know, both were alluding to the fact that that Chinese uh, real GDP growth has been falling relative to its own past. So China has been growing roughly at 6.3% to 6.4% uh, 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 around, uh, around these numbers in the last few uh, years relative to its own 
recent past of 10% growth rate, 6.7% is much lower uh, number, even though it's a higher number than uh, high income countries. And the second graph was uh, 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 expressing doubt that Chinese government uh, is able to control the situation. Both in and outside the country, there were a lot of concerns about uh, whether the moderation of the growth uh, is something that they can be well managed by, by the government. And that's the subject of our discussion. We want to understand, we, are, uh, we want to investigate causes of this moderation. And once we have a good understanding of this and, and, and use, it, uh, use that framework to think ahead about you know, what, uh, you know, what, we, what is likely to happen down the road. Now, if you want to talk about the uh, uh, causes of the, of the moderation, it's hard to ignore uh, what I call the orange elephant in the room, Pres <laughs> President Trump. Um, President Trump initiated the uh, uh, trade war, and nowadays also a tech technology war, uh, that clearly have played some role, and President Trump repeatedly mentioned that he's responsible for the big four of a stock market in China, and, and fall in Chinese growth rate, and he's very proud of it, and think this, uh, this, uh, this reduction in growth rate that he's responsible for will force the Chinese to make much bigger concessions uh, to him than otherwise uh, the case. Now, I'm going to suggest that the trade war, why it plays a role, is perhaps not the most important reason for why growth rate is around 6.3%, uh, whereas a few years early, it was uh, 10%. So trade was important, perhaps it's not as important as President Trump uh, uh, thinks. There are more structural reasons for the growth uh, moderation, and, and, and two are especially important. One is what is called converging story. That around, the, around the world, throughout economic history, generally speaking, uh, when a country's income rises, growth rate tends to come down. So, so, so if, if, uh, uh, can, if around the world, uh, per capita income or per person income tends to converge towards some common level in the very long run, this feature should imply that poorer countries have a chance to go really fast as you become less poor, growth rate should naturally come down. Right? So that, uh, that is called convergence force. So convergence force plays a role precisely because Chinese income today is so much higher than before. I just told you. Uh, it, it has been doubled in the last 10 years. And the, uh, the other important uh, structural factor is, uh, is the demographic challenges. I'm going to talk about three particular demographic challenges uh, laid down, but aging is one of the three. Uh, aging and also uh, declining uh, uh, negative growth rate of a working age cohort clearly also give you a decline in growth rates. And these two forces collectively point to the importance of the question of whether China can step up, step up its pace of innovation, whether it can replace a low-wage-based growth rate by a more innovation-based uh, uh, growth. That's a question mark that we want to uh, investigate. So the agenda for this evening's discussion will be three. So I'm going to start with a discussion about trade wars, how to understand uh, trade wars, what are the facts, what are the frictions, and could there be a deal? Could there be a solution? Uh, uh, if, if none of this happens, uh, you know, what, uh, what would that do to growth rate? That's going to be the first topic. Then I'm going to talk about structural factors, you know, diving to the structural factors affecting future growth rate, uh, the ones I just uh, mentioned. Then importantly, once we have that discussion, uh, we're going to, we, have to, we have to examine choices facing Chinese uh, uh, society and Chinese government. And I'm going to argue that different choices, the, the path of, of Chinese uh, future growth rate is not predetermined. Instead, it depends very much on which set of policies the government and the society choose to uh, pursue. So different combination of policies will lead to different uh, outcomes. And I'm going to argue that the world has a stake in the choices that China uh, uh, will make. Okay, I'm going to start with the first topic, assessing the trade war. Now I'm going to skip this. So trade war, so, so how many of you have not heard about trade war? So if you have not heard of a trade war, you might be living under rocks. So this is giving me an excuse to 
to put, put on a picture of a famous rock in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, UK and, and Australia. Now, US has been complaining about China. This administration in particular, of course, every administration has some complaints, but this administration has been more explicit and have a longer list than, than previous uh, ones. Uh, a, it says that China runs too large a trade surplus against the United States. This trade surplus or imbalanced trade position is primarily evidence uh, from President Trump's point of view that China's trade policies and practices are unfair and he's doing something uh, uh, you know, unfair to, to, to generate this very large surplus. Number one. Number two, and China uh, has not lowered trade barriers as much as it has promised when China joined WTO. So that's US uh, com uh, complaint. And number three, China uh, has not been protecting intellectual property rights as strongly as it should. Uh, so, so, so IP, uh, intellectual property rights, protection regime is weak or worse than a week. And number four, uh, China has too much restrictions on international firms operating uh, in China. And, 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 and finally, um, uh, China is not doing enough to help U.S. to address uh, its, meaning uh, U.S. Uh, uh, drug addiction uh, problem. Now, this view, so, uh, all, so, so this view is you know, worth uh, examining. So in particular, I want, want to say that this, this idea that China-US trade relationship is very unbalanced in favor of the US is worth examining because uh, it's important in two ways. One is uh, uh, President Trump says, A, this clearly shows China has been unfair to the US and not fulfilling its WTO obligations. And B, it also means that if there's a trade friction between the two countries, U.S. can clearly win because this asymmetry that, that China exports by U.S. count close to $500 billion to, U, uh, to U.S., whereas U.S. only sends uh, a quarter or, or 20 percent uh, of that uh, back to uh, China. This asymmetry, lack of, lack of balance, also means that U.S. has a lot more bullets uh, to bring against China, whereas China will run out of bullets very, very soon. So the, the, the same asymmetry also means, uh, in President Trump's, Trump's mind, that if there's a friction, U.S. clearly will win, and China has clearly have to make a uh, concession. So, so it's worth uh, taking a closer look at this, uh, 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 this uh, uh, view. Uh, so by the same token that President Trump thinks slowdown in Chinese growth rate and drop in Chinese stock market which means that uh, uh, his uh, tariff war has been very, uh, very uh, effective. Let me go skip this part. Now, so how should we understand this uh, uh, symmetry? Is it, is it the case that uh, this uh, uh, bilateral trade uh, data, you know, $500 billion from China to U.S., $100 billion from uh, uh, U.S. to China, clearly shows that uh, Chinese trade policy has, has been unfair and the bilateral relationship has been unfavorable to the U.S. Someone said, that's obvious, right? So why, is, is this, is, you know, why, why bother uh, disputing that? So first thing I want to say is, wait a minute. In fact, uh, you know, that, uh, the, the relationship, this, this uh, numbers, uh, uh, in fact, is misleading in at least three ways. Number one, number one, um, U.S. And, uh, and Chinese firms, in fact, organize their production and sales very differently. So as an example, how many of you have an iPhone in your pocket? How many of you use iPhones? There you go, so it's like a 60%. How many of you use Huawei? <laughs> That's 30%, it's pretty impressive. Huawei would be very happy to see it. See that. So um, iPhone is a very good example. So iPhone, obviously uh, Apple is a U.S. company, extremely successful U.S. company for many years. It has the largest market cap uh, in the U.S. So I, Apple sells lots of iPhones to Chinese consumers and firms. Strikingly, none of them shows up as U.S. export to China because iPhones are assembled in China, and so directly to Chinese households and firms uh, in China. 
right? So iPhone actually do not show up uh, as US export to China. In fact, more striking than that, in international trade data, iPhone is showing up as Chinese exports to the US. Because the only direction, in which, the only way iPhone shows up actually is Chinese exports to the US. Another example is uh, 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 General Motors cars. You know, automobile companies are politically very powerful, and GM is the largest US uh, auto uh, company. GM sells a lot of trucks and, and cars to Chinese households and firms. In fact, GM sells more cars to Chinese than it does to Americans for quite a few years. Okay? Most of the GM sales to Chinese do not show up as US exports to China because GM uh, uh, manufactures cars in China and sells directly in China. In so in other words, US has a lot of companies operating in China and, and do their sales directly to the Chinese. In comparison, they are relative, of course, Chinese can also invest in the US. But comparatively, few Chinese companies actually operate in the US uh, and sell directly to, China, to US uh, consumers uh, and, uh, uh, and, and firms. So one adjustment you have to make is to look, if you look at the total sales by US firm to China with total Chinese uh, com company sales to, to, to US uh, uh, customers, these two numbers are a lot more balanced than goods trade data. That's number one. Number two, if you think about bilateral commercial relationship, you, can, you, you should not just focus on goods trade. You should also look at service trade. Right? So for example, you know, you all, we are in university. So US universities are one of the most important export engines uh, in, the, in the US. So I teach at Columbia University. I see a lot of uh, students coming from uh, China, uh, China. If you go to Chinese university, you can see American students, but far fewer. And, and, and US education sector is a, is a successful exporting sector. It's not just education sector. More on accounting, investment banking, and many others, uh, you, uh, you will have uh, uh, you know, US are major uh, exporters. So there are plenty of Chinese publicly listed companies that you use top four US accounting firms to do auditing. How many US companies use Chinese accounting firms? Virtually none. So uh, uh, it, it, that's not surprising because US has a very strong competitive advantage in modern services. And, and modern service sector is a major exporting sector for the US. So if you look at the service trade, US runs a surplus against China today, roughly $40 billion uh, every year. It ran, surplus, it ran a surplus last year, it ran a surplus the year before. In fact, US has been running uh, surplus in, in bilateral service trade every year uh, that, 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 that you have recorded the uh, data. So when you look at the bilateral, even if you look at just trade, you want to take into account service trade as well as goods trade. That's number two. Number three, even if you look at a goods trade, it's also important to recognize that there's a difference between exports, you know, gross export value and exports of domestic value added. What do I mean by that? So going back to the iPhone example. So iPhone, as I said, in the data is recorded as Chinese exports to the US. The latest uh, the version of iPhone retails for roughly $1,100 in the US. In trade data, so every iPhone China ships to the US, in the customs, it probably shows up as about $400. The rest will be marketing and direct profit, profit margin uh, of, uh, of uh, Apple company. Even for this $400 per phone data, the Chinese value added, meaning payment to workers and some profits to Chinese local power suppliers, collectively account for roughly 10% of the $400. So $40 out of uh, iPhone uh, are Chinese uh, uh, value added. Why? Because China Chinese uh, companies are at the relatively low end of the entire supply chain. So most of the other value added, so the $400 minus $40, what, what happens, you know, where is the other $360 come from? Well, they come from Korea, Japan, sometimes US, uh, maybe United Kingdom, uh, and, and other uh, uh, countries. That's what you get when you have uh, global supply chains where China sits at relatively low part of the downstream part of the production chain. 
Now, if you look at, of course, that's extreme example. So if you look at the overall trade, so my co-authors and I, Robert Krugman, who's now WTO chief economist, and Zhu Wang, and I uh, developed a methodology uh, published in American Economic Review that shows, you, shows when how to systematically do this accounting, decompose growth trade into value added coming from different countries. Using that methodology, you will find that for every $100 that, uh, that uh, the Chinese firm sent to the US, roughly half of them, or $50, are Chinese value added. So iPhone turned out to be an extreme example. But on average, half of the Chinese exports are Chinese value added. In comparison, for every $100 that US sends to China, $85 are US value added. Why? Because US sectors tend to be on the upstream part of the supply chains. What do US exports? A uh, uh, lot of machines, uh, including machines used to make uh, uh, iPhones. So US collectively, US firms are on the upper part of the uh, production chains. So you have to do that adjustment as well. Once you do all three adjustments, take into account value chain, uh, feature of the trade, take into account service trade, take into account direct sales to local customer households from uh, uh, FDI, the bilateral commercial relationship turns out to be a lot more balanced uh, than the official goods trade data shows you. So in a strict sense, so when President Trump said, I can keep adding, adding a tariff on Chinese imports from China, do Chinese have bullets to make US firms suffer? The answer is yes, including you know, you can have special tax on Goldman Sachs operating in China, or um, uh, special, special taxes on US firms operating in China. So there are plenty of things China can do to make US firms uh, feel the pain. But you also want to ask a different question. How many, what, how many options th uh, does China have that will make US firms feel the pain while not hurting Chinese consumers and firms? The answer is very few. So most of the things you can think about, in, in fact, uh, will hurt both sides. Uh, that's one reason why we actually don't see uh, Chinese do this. Same logic, in fact, applies to US as well. Most of the things US do hurts firms and consumers on both sides. It's just that President Trump insists, I don't care, or that's not the case. He ins insists that's not the case. And most economists look at the data and say, most things either country can do tend to hurt the, uh, both, uh, both countries. All right, so these are the adjustments. Now, uh, on Chinese uh, internet, so some of you, if you use WeChat, you might get uh, send a photo like this. So, so one Chinese, uh, in response to the, uh, the last round of uh, additional tariff President Trump uh, announced, one Chinese uh, restaurant owner put out a banner that says, uh, I'm gonna impose 25% extra charge on any American customers coming into my restaurant. Obviously, he was exp expressing a sentiment. The reason I put it here is that is to sh uh, show you sometimes what one understands intuitively, what, what you understand intuitively is one thing, but when, when you think about it more carefully, you realize uh, actual logic can very well go the opposite direction. So, so in this particular case, I'm gonna suggest that what this restaurant owner does is the opposite of what he should have done. So what, uh, what, what, he, so what he's doing, uh, having extra charge, uh, charge on US customers is in the exact same direction of what President Trump does. Why? Because the sale of Chinese restaurant to American customers is part of Chinese service exports to the US. So what he's doing is to levy extra tax on Chinese service exports uh, to the US, exactly the same as what Trump does. If he really wants to do the opposite of what Trump does, what he should have done, is to, in, instead of raising American cost of buying Chinese goods and services, he should raise the, the cost of Chinese customers buying American products. For example, he can say, I'm gonna impose 25% extra charge on all Chinese customers coming to my restaurant if you have an iPhone in your, in your pocket, or drive a US brand in the cars, or have sent your children to, to UK or US uh, for schools, or intend to send your children to US for uh, education. That will be the opposite of what President Trump does. So it illustrates one's direct intuition may turn out to be quite different from economic logic will tell you. 
But it also illustrates, of course, you think, wow, why would he do that? Because that will certainly be painful to the Chinese uh, consumer's interest. This also says tariff actually is a very bad thing. It might hurt the other side. It, it also hurt your side. So this example suggests, you know, of course, the restaurant owners is not going to do that because it will hurt the Chinese uh, consumers. But in fact, uh, President Trump's uh, uh, tariff policy also hurts American firms uh, and consumers uh, as uh, well. Now let's uh, take a look at the Chinese actual trade policy. I said that you know, uh, one of the uh, other chief complaints by the US is China has not been fulfilling its, w its obligation uh, when it joins WTO. In particular, uh, it has not uh, uh, liberalized uh, uh, very much. So the way to, to see this is, uh, is this. So I, 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 you know, uh, I'm being a researcher, want to uh, uh, use data to, to, to uh, you know, look at the data, see, see, see what data tells us. Right? So I'm going to show you a graph uh, that has two, uh, two messages. Let me first describe the graph in words and then show you the graph. So, the, so I'm going to show you a graph uh, uh, that has tariff rate on the vertical axis. Uh, and then on the, on the horizontal axis will be per capita income. So what I'm going to do in that graph is two things. One is I'm going to see uh, across the world what is the countries I'm going to measure uh, trade policy by tariff. It's something that's relatively easy to quantify. You know, not all countries have the same tariff. I'm going to show you around the world there's a very strong regularities, which is that richer countries tend to have lower tariffs. So, so tariff rate of a country tends to be strongly negatively associated with country income level. I'm going to show you that graph. Then, then I'm going to show you a second piece of information. I look at the time series uh, of a Chinese uh, tariff policy. And of course, in the last you know, 10, 15 years, Chinese income has been rising very fast. And we're going to trace out actual Chinese tariff uh, as the income increases. So on this graph, this is the graph uh, that I just described. described. The, uh, what's on the uh, horizontal axis is, uh, is income per capita in log, uh, logarithmic uh, measures. All the gray dots give you essentially cross-country regularities. Uh, just ignore the red dots, uh, red lines for the moment. So all the gray dots uh, tells you around the world in, tw in this one year, 2017, what is the relationship between a country's average income level uh, and average uh, uh, tariff? Uh, tariff is, is average weighted ba based on partner country's ability to export product by product. You see a negative association. Uh, poorer countries tend to have higher tariff. Rich countries tend to have lower tariff. This is in 2017, one year. Cross, cross country in one year. Then the red line uh, pr traces out essentially the evolution of Chinese trade policy from 1992 to, uh, uh, to, to 2017. Going from left to right, of course, China becomes richer and richer. So that's why you know, the per capita income is rising. Uh, what you see is in early days, China had extremely high tariff. Coming out of socialist uh, uh, central plan model, had very high uh, tariff, didn't believe in globalization. So right around this, this is the, this is the time when China, jo China joined WTO on December 11th, 2001, so it's roughly uh, here. So in preparation for joining WTO, it has cut, it has cut tariff uh, step by step, uh, and then it promised to cut tariff further uh, in over a five-year uh, five um, transition period. So you actually see the tariff does come down. So around the, by 2005 and 2006, the tariff has come down to below the norm that you would expect it based the country's uh, income at that time. So what does that mean? So Chinese tariff is higher than the US, for sure. Uh, but it's mostly because China is a poorer country. So, so th there are two ways to think about the Chinese uh, uh, trade, uh, trade uh, regime. On the one hand, if you just compare China with the US, US has lower tariff on average against all trading partners than what China does. On the other hand, if you compare China to its own past, you see China has cut tariff steadily and dramatically. In fact, during this period from 1992 to 2017, there is no other country that has cut trade barriers as much 
uh, more than China, uh, uh, China uh, has. And this show, by the, by the way, in other countries, exports to China as well, not Chinese exports to other countries. So take US as an example. So US exports to China roughly doubles once every six years. There are no other country, no other destinations to which U US exports grows that fast. Now, uh, US exports to, to China grows that fast uh, for two reasons. One is Chinese, China has cut down tariff much faster than most other countries, and the, the other, of course, China as a market has been growing much faster than most other uh, countries. The combination of these two uh, give, you, uh, give you this. So what does that mean? The other way to uh, say this, China still has way to go. Uh, me as an econo economist, especially international economist, think most times trade barriers are not, uh, not just not good for other countries' exporters, not good for your own, uh, yourself. So, so it is in China's uh, interest and the world's interest for, ch for China to continue to liberalize its trade regimes. On the other hand, one should recognize this is a country that has done a lot of liberalization. Uh, perhaps uh, you know, more so than uh, other, uh, other countries during this, uh, 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 this uh, period, and uh, probably will continue to uh, do, uh, uh, do so. It shows up not just in tariff data, like I said, it also shows up in US exports to China and other countries' exports to China. I have not looked at the UK exports to China, but I won't be surprised that uh, UK exports to China has also been growing faster than UK exports to most other countries. The other complaints about uh, uh, intellectual property rights protection. So clearly, Chinese intellectual property rights protection is far from perfect. A lot of problems, a lot of room for improvement. But it's also useful to look at uh, data just to put things in perspective. So, so, uh, so on this, um, one way is what kind of data can you get? Uh, well, so it turns out, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you have protected intellectual property rights, one way this shows up in the data uh, is loyalty payment to foreign patent holders. And that data uh, is recorded as part of a balance of payment data. So here on this graph, I also have two pieces of information. If you have good uh, eyesight, you'll see many gray dots. How many of you can see the gray dots? I'll say, okay, good. If you cannot see the gray dots, you have your eyes checked, <laughs> eyes, eyesight checked. Anyway, so there are a lot of gray dots. What is the gray dots? This gray dots looks at so the uh, uh, relationship between income level per capita, uh, which I have on the uh, horizontal axis, uh, and outbound royalty payment to foreign patent holders is a share of the country's uh, GDP on the vertical axis. So these two are strongly positively correlated. On balance, as the country becomes richer, it pays out more uh, royalty payment to foreign patent holders as a share of the size of the economy, you know, relative to the size of the economy. This positive relationship perhaps reflects multiple forces. Uh, most importantly, as income rises, perhaps intellectual property rights regime becomes stronger. And also, as income rises, perhaps the country will use more knowledge-intensive product and there's more need to, uh, in, uh, including using more uh, foreign created uh, uh, knowledges. Combination with the, of the two will give you a positive relationship like this. So these are the gray dots and the dark black line traces out sort of the normal relationship one see across countries. Now the red lines or red triangles are time series of uh, Chinese uh, royalty payment to foreign patent holders as a share of Chinese GDP uh, over, from 1997 to 2017. Uh, okay, so during this 11-year uh, uh, period, first of all, you see Chinese royalty payment not only rises uh, because economy becomes larger, but, but royalty payment is a share of Chinese very rapidly expanding economy also rises, the share rises over time, much like what international norm would have uh, predicted. You know, there were early years, you know, that you, have, you have time that's below uh, uh, the, 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 the international average, but the, uh, the, my, my two dotted line, lines are what's called confidence uh, band. That is, 
you know, within statistically acceptable levels, so the, so the, the red triangles more or less follow uh, international uh, norm. Given how fast Chinese economic size grows, in fact, the, the dollar value of the outbound loyalty payment has been growing extremely fast. Uh, so uh, 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 as a share of GDP uh, also grows, but not as fast as the dollar value of, of, of this. So this um, picture, I think, suggests uh, also, I, I think, is consistent with the possibility that uh, you know, why IP regime uh, is imperfect, it grows in strength. Uh, and clearly, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, if, if there's no uh, IP protection, there will be no falling uh, uh, patent uh, payment. Uh, and if there's no IP protection, there will be no uh, knowledge intensive firms wanting to, to, to uh, operate uh, in, uh, 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 in China. So um, I think uh, um, between the, uh, among the things the U.S. Uh, wants China to do, reaching agreement on IP, I, stronger IP protection, I think, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is probably uh, most promising. Uh, a, because China has been doing uh, uh, lots of those to, 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 to strengthen this, as data shows. B, perhaps as important, perhaps even more important than this, is that as Chinese own domestic innovation uh, increases, domestic demand for stronger IP protection will also uh, come. And they will contribute. So together with lobbying by multinational firms, the, co the conference of both domestic lobbying and international lobbying uh, will give you stronger, uh, stronger IP protection. In other words, perhaps 20, 20 years ago, stronger IP protection mostly means more transfer of money from Chinese company to international company. Today and in the future, stronger IP protection also means uh, stronger protection of IP, uh, international property rights, created by uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese company. That change in the composition of IP, I think, uh, will also mean uh, 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 that you know, in an international agreement on stronger protection uh, uh, will be uh, it, it's quite feasible. Now, if trade barriers and trade wars hurt both sides, why do we see so many Americans uh, supporting supporting uh, um, uh, President Trump's uh, uh, trade war. And that's, uh, that's important. So, so this in economics can be called political economy. Political economy is a branch of economics studying why it's not about efficiency of policy, but why do people support certain, uh, certain policies? And it, it's a branch of economics. I don't know, Adam Smith was a pioneer? Yeah, Adam Smith. So, so it's, appropriate topic to discuss uh, here. So I think there are perhaps two reasons, uh, four reasons, right? So one is uh, most people do not do international comparison. Like the graph I show you, I, unfortunately I think very few reporters have seen this and reporters you know, uh, are not always well-trained well uh, uh, economics. Uh, uh, you know, in it, we we uh, uh, tend to focus just on static cross-country comparison but we don't, we, we don't bring in international, systematic international comparison in, 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 uh, into our way of looking at the things, looking at the issues. And number two, the bilateral trade makes pie bigger, but doesn't automatically make everyone's piece of pie bigger. So trade, and in US-China trade included, can create losers as well as winners. So this particular point has been recognized formally in economics, perhaps uh, for about 50 years or so. So it's not a new topic, new uh, idea, but potentially applicable uh, in US-China trade. And it's why people who lose, so, so in particular, a, a popular view today, in, uh, at least in the US, is that globalization and trading with China in particular makes capitalists, people who own firms, people who have a lot of money, even richer. But Many workers lose. That's the idea. Okay. That's widely accepted. My next point is to challenge this. I think another important thing is that many winners mistakenly think they are losers. There are a lot more winners than people think, uh, than people recognize, and many winners erroneously think they are losers. And number f uh, number f number four, uh, China has become very big. 
uh, it's too big uh, for, 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 for the US. I don't know why I'm missing the second part of the, my, my sentence. Uh, if uh, the same kind of uh, unbalanced trade happened to US and, Mex uh, US and uh, Vietnam or US or Costa Rica, it won't make into uh, news uh, in, the, uh, in the US. In fact, the US does run a deficit against most of its trading partners. So China is not unique in their, uh, in, in their way, especially when you scale a deficit by partner, partner countries' economic size. US runs deficit against most partners, but most, of course, uh, we know right now all other partners are smaller than, uh, than, uh, than China. So the size of China also matters. Now, points one, three, uh, one, two, four are relatively easier to understand and relatively well discussed. Three, perhaps, is somewhat surprising that many winners mistakenly think they are losers. So I want to spend a few minutes uh, explaining this, uh, this part. So, so President Trump is a candidate for president, and then after assuming office, said repeatedly, trading with China is bad for American workers, uh, uh, leading to, uh, in, uh, leading to you know, Ch the Chinese steal our jobs, is his, uh, uh, is his uh, line. President uh, Trump is a man uh, with passionate use of verbs, nouns, and other you know, his, his, he has his linguistic uh, abilities. But, so many people say, you know, most, many things President Trump, many people in, in, the, in America says, most things President Trump says probably are baseless. But at least on these things, he perhaps was right that trading with China has uh, caused unemployment rate in the U.S. Uh, to go up. For example, uh, uh, there, are people, uh, there are very serious economists uh, publish research articles in top economic journals that seems to say the same thing. So uh, David Otter, David Dong, and Gordon Hansen, uh, uh, two, so these are these three persons, two top economists in U.S. and one top economist in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, uh, published a paper in a top economics journal demonstrating this idea or showing this idea that trading with China has led to an increase in U.S. unemployment. There's another paper by Pierce, uh, Pierce and Short uh, in same top journal, somewhat different methodology, reaching the same conclusion. So people say, at least on this, uh, President Trump seems to be right. So I want to explain how do, peop how do, uh, the, do these people reach this conclusion, okay? So the way to do this is this. Right? So, so this is a map of the United States. You can subdivide United States labor market into many, many local labor markets uh, in the, uh, using the language of the U.S. Census Bureau, commuting zone. So commuting zone is typically a city and surrounding areas. It's called commuting zone because you can think of, you know, intuitively after finishing breakfast, you can take a bus or subway to go to work or drive to your work. So within your driving distance, that's called commuting zone. So the entire country can be broken down into 700 22 commuting zones. You can count them, you're going to find exactly 722 of them, okay? So, so, so there are 722 local labor markets. For each local labor market, you can do two things. Number one, based on uh, each local labor market's uh, you know, trading history with China. So from 2000, the, the last year before China joined WTO, to 2007, the last year before U.S. Entering, uh, entering global financial crisis or U.S. Uh, financial crisis. During this seven-year period, because different local labor markets have different uh, industrial structure, some will experience huge increase in growth of imports from China. Others will experience relatively little increase in growth of imports from China because they have different in industrial structures. For example, if, you, if, if, if this happened to be a commuting zone or local labor market uh, that used to be heavy in garment industries. U.S. during this seven, you know, period from 2000 to 2007, U.S. has imported huge amount of garment uh, uh, product from China. So you, uh, Chinese GDP doubles roughly once every 10 years, sorry, once every ten, uh, seven years uh, during this period. But Chinese exports to U.S doubles once every four years. Chinese garment exports to US doubles once a year. 
It's like extremely fast workforce. If you, happen, your, if your local labor market happen to be specialized in garment production or used to be specialized in garment industry, you're going to be wiped out by potentially imports of garment from China. On the other hand, if you look at uh, Manhattan, whose primary industries are investment banks, commercial banks, accounting firm, law firm, two universities, and very large uh, Catholic church uh, community, they don't import from China, essentially. Right? So, so Manhattan will, be, will experience essentially close to zero import of, uh, of, uh, of a stuff. Uh, uh, you know, the industry will be very little affected by imports from China. So, so you can sort all 722 local labor markets based on how much they are affected by imports from China. From worst affected, second worst affected, third worst affected, all the way down to very little affected. So that's one way to rank these 722 places. That's one rank. Separately, you can, for each uh, area, you can look at what happens to the local labor market. What happens to total employment growth during the same time period. You can rank them from you know, uh, uh, you know, best performing labor market, second best performing labor market, third best performing labor market to terrible uh, performing labor market all the way to the worst performing labor market. So that's the second way to rank these 722 cities. You look at these two lists, you'll notice a very strong negative association between these two lists. In other words, regions that have experienced more growth of imports from China due to local industrial composition tend to have worse local labor market performance. Employment growth is much worse than national average, or unemployment would have increased faster than national average. So this is what this picture shares. This picture, this comes from uh, uh, Otto Don Hansen uh, study. There are 722 dots on it. You can count them. Exactly 722 dots on them. Each dot represents one commuting zone. So uh, for a given commuting zone, uh, the value on the horizontal axis is how much exposure this region has to imports from China, a growth of imports from China. For the same dots, the value on the vertical axis is what happens to total employment of that place. Okay, so each dot is one story. There are altogether 722 stories on this graph. You look at the, across all 722 stories, you find the overall message is the more exposed you, you are to the growth of imports from China, the worse total employment there seems to be. And that's hence they say, look, uh, import, from, import trading with China is terrible for our, our, uh, for our jobs. Now this, of course, this graph so far describes a correlation. These people are smart people and they have additional tools to show it's not just correlation, it's also causality. I don't have time to explain how to go from correlation to causality, but but uh, this is the basic story. Is this right? This work is extremely, extremely influential. Well cited by economists, well reported on uh, TVs, and perhaps has been summarized by President Trump and he liked it. Perhaps. Is it right? Not quite. Why not? Well, if you look at what US imports from China, uh, details, you realize, in fact, what U.S. buys from China are not just stuff that goes into Walmart or Kmart. U.S. also buys parts and components and uh, intermediate goods from China, things that go into the production by U.S. firm. So U.S. firm, I'm going to call them downstream U.S. firm, that uses imported inputs from China, potentially can become more competitive relative to firms elsewhere in the world. This greater competitiveness can allow them to employ more labor rather than less labor. So that this downstream channel can potentially create jobs, increase employment uh, rather, than, uh, rather than reverse. So what this uh, uh, means is that even if we just focus on the import side, uh, the, the competition reducing job is only one aspect. There's also a different aspect coming from the global you know, supply chain perspective. Being able to use less expensive China-made inputs expands US jobs. 
So you have to sum up those channels and, and see what happens uh, 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 through the total, uh, total effect. So, so, so that's what I'm doing. So on this graph, I, I look at the same 722 stories, 22 local labor markets, except now on, for each local labor market, you can count there are 722 of them, for each labor, labor market, the corresponding value on the uh, horizontal axis is what I call total exposure to growth of imports from China. So that sums up job loss due to direct competition, but job gains due to down, what I call downstream effect. I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit. There's also an upstream effect. I'm skipping in the, in the discussion. But you sum up all the channels through, through the supply chain uh, you know, uh, uh, lens, you find, in fact, on average, regions with more, expo more total exposure to import growth from China tend to do better in terms of local job performance relative to national average. So in other words, the job expansion effect coming from supply chain perspective outweighs the job loss effect coming from competition. So once you take, you uh, use a more holi holistic uh, uh, lens to look at the uh, data. Now, Otto and Hansen are all my friends, you know, economists, uh, are a sm small community, so they ask, how, how is it possible? Explain to me how this indirect downstream channel can be more powerful than our more direct competition channel. So it's important to understand this. And the way to understand this is to ask ourselves two questions. Question number one, what kind of U.S. industries will be hurt by imports from China through direct competition, so imports from China displacing locally produced products? The answer, a subset of U.S. manufacturing industries. Only manufacturing firms import from China to first order approximation, except for air transport. If, you, if, uh, if uh, my, my Columbia colleagues takes Air China to go to uh, Shanghai, that's part of Chinese airport, air transport service exports to US, but they are tiny uh, in the data. Essentially, only manufacturing sectors will import from China, and only a subset of them import a lot. And top tools are textile garments, number one, and computers and other electronic equipments and parts, number two. So these are the top two uh, sectors, manufacturing sectors. Uh, uh, with which U.S. imports a lot. So a subset of, subset of manufacturing, I have a graph to show this. So the, so the subset of, so, so this uh, decomposed U.S. economy into many sectors, from agriculture to the manufacturing sectors and to services. Services don't buy from China. Manufacturing sector do. A subset of them buy a lot from China. These are the places where you expect to see huge job losses due to direct competition. That's question number one. Question number two, what kind of sectors in the US that, sh that, will, that, are, that should be expected to benefit from being able to use less expensive China-made inputs? Let me pause for a second to see if anyone will volunteer to help us. Which sectors will benefit from being able to use China-made uh, inputs? Anyone? Aviation. Aviation, why? How does it help? How does it benefit from China made inputs? Many high tech parts will be able to produce more cheaply in China than. So, very good. So, many manufacturing firms will, can benefit from China made parts. For example, let's go back to automobile. So, so this professor mentioned the aviation, but uh, automobile uh, industry. Uh, U.S. Uh, overall automobile production, I think, is greater than uh, airplane uh, production. But airplanes certainly uh, works as well. 15 years ago, the most important foreign auto parts supplies to U.S. automobile industries are Canada, Japan, and Mexico. Today, the most important foreign auto parts supplies are Chinese firms, like Wanxiang Company and, and the like. So certainly manufacturing uh, U.S. firms can benefit from this downstream channel because they can buy, uh, they do buy 
uh, parts and components from China uh, a lot. Importantly, service sectors also can benefit from China-made uh, inputs. So even in you know, universities, uh, you know, accounting firms, and, 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 and investment banks, other than human you know, uh, cost, the most important cost of those companies will be computers and electronic equipment and furniture and, and so on. Today, the, most, the, the dominant supply globally of those things are Chinese companies. So even service sectors that do not uh, directly uh, you know, participate in international trade indirectly benefit from China-made uh, inputs. Government sectors, in fact, benefit from that. So government sectors, again, uh, besides uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, human resource cost, the most important cost will be various kinds of electric, uh, electric equipment and so on. Research institutes, you know, the, research, you know, the lab coats you wear, these are part of garment, ex uh, garment uh, exports from China. Hospitals, bed sheets are part of the garment uh, products as well. So in other words, subsidy manufacturing fir fir firms are hurt by imports from China through competition effect. Virtually all sectors benefit uh, by being able to use China-made uh, inputs. That's, that's actually the last uh, col column. The downstream, downstream uh, channel actually works through uh, almost all sectors. I'm going to skip this. If you look at wages, using the, the uh, Otto Don Hansen way of looking at effect, if, if you think of trading with China, simply means competition effect. What does that do to US wages? So uh, a group of economists following Otto Dan Hansen, if you can put, uh, put the workers into different buckets based on their initial wages. So there will be very, very poor workers, slightly less, slightly better pay workers, slightly better pay workers, all the way to the best pay workers. 20 buckets. What you will find is that average worker in each bucket, that's this line, in fact, appears to lose out from U.S. trading with China. So capitalist seems to gain. Average worker in each of those buckets seems to lose. If you take into account supply chain perspective, you'll find, in fact, 75, so capitalists continue to gain, but 75% of workers also gain. You work, you know, they, uh, you know, their, their real income actually rises due to U.S. trading with China, U.S. importing from China. 25% uh, uh, workers uh, lose. So the distinction between what I'm saying and what the new consensus uh, is important to bear in mind. The new consensus uh, uh, is this, right? So globalization makes the pie bigger, but in reality, all the gains goes to capitalists. Workers are left uh, worse off. What I'm saying is, yes, capitalists uh, are, are gaining, but in fact, majority of workers also gain. Uh, 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 minority workers actually lose from trading with China. Then people say, how can it be? So why, how come workers don't feel that way? Clearly, we know that many blue collar workers in the last election switched from supporting Democratic candidates to President Trump. So they don't feel, uh, they don't feel that way. I think the reason, important reason is that most people understand direct effect very well. And they do not understand indirect effect very well. So in other words, when a, f when a company fires workers, you know, they will tell workers, you know, look, I'm so sorry. I know your family needs money, but our country buys too much stuff from China. We are, while, you know, your work order has shrunk, and you, I have to let you go. So workers who are left, uh, who's left, uh, uh, let go understand he or she loses the job because the country is buying too much from China. What we are seeing is that many sectors expand also because U.S. trading with China. Uh, China supply inputs makes those firms competitive and they expand employment. But when those firms hire workers, it's very unlikely they will tell their workers, congratulations, you have your job, better pay than your previous job because our country buys inputs from China. Instead, almost all, very likely they will say, you should thank me. I'm a smart entrepreneur. You get your new job because I'm a smart entrepreneur, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm smart. So I think there's a, 
uh, natural asymmetry built in the society that, uh, that uh, uh, if winners lose uh, wins from globalization, he or she may not realize that uh, globalization is the channel for his or her gain. But when he or she loses jobs, his boss, former boss, the media, and maybe some other people will tell him or her, you lose your job because of, of, of globalization. So I think uh, that's important to keep in uh, keeping, uh, mind. So economic education is very important. We have a lot of professors uh, here. So attitudes towards globalization, perhaps Brexit, you know, taking into account indirect effect is very important. Uh, so, uh, all right. So will there be a solution to to uh, U.S.-China trade uh, dispute. So, so now, given the telephone conversation between the two, two presidents, there's new hope emerged. La, uh, last uh, uh, September, I think, the, the last G20 uh, meeting, there was a lot, when there was a lot of uh, optimistic uh, hope, people asked me, do you think there will be a deal? My answer then was, there may be a deal, but it's very unlikely to be a solution. That's not, you know, it's not going to be a deal that will last very long. And why did I say that? And why do I continue to think so? The important reason is U.S. tax cut. The U.S. tax cut uh, last year uh, is going to make U.S. trade deficit to be bigger, uh, uh, and uh, U.S. intuitively think that uh, Chinese uh, trade policy and trade practice uh, has uh, deteriorated rather than, rather than improved. So why do I say that? Well, an important uh, um, message or relationship from open economy macroeconomics. How many of you have taken op macroeconomics? <laughs> we have professors who teach macroeconomics. So those who have, who have not should try to uh, take Professor Ding's class, macroeconomics. So I teach macroeconomics. <laughs> so one uh, very basic message from macroeconomics is a country's trade deficit uh, has trade deficit, deficit because the country saving is too low relative to investment. When you have a saving shortage relative to investment, you're going to run a deficit. Conversely, if a country has a surplus, like China, it has a surplus because country's saving rate uh, is higher than its investment rate. So when saving is greater than investment, you're going to have a surplus. When saving is less than investment, you can have a deficit. So U.S. deficit uh, is the outcome of a saving shortage related to investment. The tax cut will lead to a much bigger U.S. fiscal deficit, deficit, which means government negative saving will become even more negative. By how much? Uh, 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 estimates uh, suggest it will be between one trillion U.S. dollar to two trillion U.S. dollars over the next ten years. So if you, if you are Democratic consultants, you think the two trillion dollars. If you are Republicans, but but sensible Republicans, you will say one trillion dollars. So that's the uh, uh, increase. If this drop in government saving is not offset by increase in firm saving or household saving, and and, and research suggests it's very unlikely to be the case. This is going to give you more uh, U.S. trade deficit, a bigger U.S. trade deficit. Now, if this decline in saving is offset by decline in investment, you might not get big, bigger deficit. But it's the point of trade uh, of tax cut is not to make investment lower, but to make investment higher. So if saving has come down, but investment goes up, of course, deficit will be even bigger. So the bottom line is that last year's U.S. trade deficit, which is going to be, it's not one-time cut, it's going to be uh, you know, a permanently lower U.S. deficit and, and therefore lower savings, um, is going to generate a bigger U.S. multilateral trade deficit on the order of, of about $1 trillion to $2 trillion over the next 10 uh, years. Now, this extra U.S. trade deficit is not an abstract concept it will translate into, translate into greater bilateral U.S. deficit against many individual partners, including China. So if the past uh, pattern of a bilateral deficit reflects some structural relationship, that means the most of the extra U.S. trade deficit will show up as bilateral deficit against China. Here comes the problem. When U.S. politicians see 
higher U.S. deficit with China, they have, most of them are lawyers. They, are, they have not taken macroeconomics. If we did, probably didn't do, didn't do very well in the courses. The instinct will be something is wrong, something's getting worse on the Chinese side. How come after many rounds of a tough negotiation, your surplus against me has become bigger, or my deficit against you have become uh, bigger? And they're going to now think about more sanctioning, more other stuff to do. So, so uh, therefore, my prediction that, I, that uh, the very large U.S. trade deficit, tax cuts will lead to much larger bilateral U.S. deficit against China, and therefore, this will be one structural reason for very tough, a uh, very tense relationship between the two uh, countries. So, 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 you know, China can promise to buy more stuff, but fundamentally, if this does not help to address U.S. Saving, greater saving shortage related to the investment, it's not going to uh, help uh, very, uh, very uh, much. What could help bilateral relationship in terms of managing trade frictions? Interestingly, China has implemented a sequence of very aggressive tax cuts. The, the Chinese leaders didn't perhaps have you didn't uh, have tax cut to reduce bilateral uh, uh, trade, uh, you know, China's su trade surplus against the U.S., but mostly to try to help with uh, uh, growth moderation. So China has drastically reduced corporate income tax in January, uh, then reduced value added tax twice, uh, last year from 17% to 16%, and this March from 16% to 13%. And also, uh, this March reduced employers' contribution rate to Social Security tax from 20% to 18%. To uh, so this combination of a relatively aggressive tax cut, same logic applies. The Chinese tax cut will reduce Chinese overall savings rate and therefore will reduce Chinese overall trade surplus. So that, you know, politicians without knowledge of macroeconomics will think, oh, Bilateral deficit imbalance actually will, will come down. So that, ironically, will have one unintended consequences of helping to soothe the bilateral relationship a little, uh, a little uh, bit. But fundamentally, the uh, U.S. will continue to have large overall deficit against most countries and therefore will against, uh, be against uh, uh, China. But Chinese deficit will help this a little, uh, little uh, bit. Now, of course, the bilateral relationship goes beyond trade war, and now you have there are also uh, tech, uh, technology war and, and differences in negoti negotiation style may also uh, matters. Whether you, the last thing I want to say on the trade war is whether the U.S. can uh, disconnect China from the global economy depends not so much on U.S. policy, but, uh, but on China's own policies, but also on other countries' uh, uh, attitudes. When you are trying to impose various uh, uh, costs on Chinese uh, firms, what does what do United Kingdom and other European countries can do in, in fact uh, uh, matters? If other countries follow U.S., they can squeeze uh, Chinese firm uh, uh, very uh, very much, and Chinese Chinese economy will be disconnected from this. On the other hand, if other countries view uh, U.S. demand as excessive, and do not always collaborate with the uh, U.S. In fact, the U.S. action will have to be scaled down because sanctions on Chinese uh, firms uh, would make U.S. firm less competitive globally uh, uh, when uh, in competition with European firms or Japanese firms because Ch China is a major uh, uh, component supplier, part supplier to global firms. So without collaboration from other uh, countries, uh, in fact, uh, 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 trade, it's harder for U.S. to win uh, trade war. So, so, in fact, other countries' attitudes will be very, uh, very important. I want to um, um, now ha uh, assess uh, beyond trade war, uh, structural factors underlying Chinese growth, and also take a look at whether ch Chinese firm can successfully uh, innovate. So um, demographic challenges, uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I, I have to say this very quickly. So, so uh, China used to have an extremely um, favorable demographic pattern, uh, perhaps 
unnaturally favorable demographic patterns. As a developing country, you tend to have large and growing working age cohort. Globally, that's the case. Rich country tend to have lower fertility rate, poorer country have, tend to have high fertility rate, and they give you a growing uh, working age cohort. China's relatively strict family planning policy, uh, starting from 1980s, for a while by reducing number of children uh, 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 being born relative to what nature intended, temporarily didn't change working age cohort very much, because they're young babies. It takes a while for them to become workers. And yet, it, it helped to reduce dependence ratio. So for a while, China had a unnaturally favorable ratio of number of people who are working relative to number of people who are not working, baby plus uh, old people. So, so not just favorable, but unnaturally favorable. That's good for growth. China uh, also had uh, uh, this uh, family planning policy also contribute to uh, gender selective abortions. So China had a unnaturally high boys to girls ratio. And this boys, unnaturally high boys and girls uh, ratio also ironically lead to high growth rate. So let's see if I have time to explain it. So first, uh, in terms of, uh, but all those things have changed. Because the family pregnancy policy has been so strict and lasted for so long, eventually when you have too few babies are born, today too few uh, young adults are entering labor force. So that working age cohort, people from age you know, 18 to 50 something, their cohort has been growing at a negative rate starting from 2011. So that what used to be unnaturally favorable for growth becomes unnaturally unfavorable for growth. You have negative working age cohort. Same family uh, policy also creates a, uh, a severe aging problem. So fewer people are entering labor force, yet their parents, grandparents, and grandparents' friends are still retiring. So the ratio of retirees plus young people that needs to be supported by uh, working age people becomes abnormally high. So that's also unfavorable to growth. The demand on public, uh, public sector is very high. Sex ratio. China used to have uh, this very unusually uh, you know, high young man to young woman ratio, leading to a shortage of bribes. And that lead to uh, many people, so shortage of bribes means many young men will not be able to find a girlfriend or wife, mathematically speaking. But they, do, they really want to have a girlfriend or wife. And their parents really want them to have a girlfriend or wife. What do they do? Three responses. So do they soon, uh, they, what, what do you do? You realize that richer men have relatively easier time to find a girlfriend or wife. That's true in today's China. That's true in today's United Kingdom. That's true in old China and old the United Kingdom. Richer men tend to have an easier time to find girlfriend and wife. Implication, if you have a shortage of bribes, you respond by raising your savings rate, you respond by working harder, you respond by trying to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, entrepreneurship is a high risk, but also high return things. And you actually see in the data that uh, you can see that uh, across regions, uh, you know, even though uh, you know, the overall national young man to young woman ratio is 115 men uh, to 100, 100 women, meaning one out of every nine young men cannot find a girlfriend or wife, uh, mathematically speaking. That's national number. But the young man to young woman ratio is very uneven across regions. You find that regions with more severe uh, uh, sex ratio imbalance tend to have much faster rate of entrepreneurship growth measured by rate of growth of private sec newly registered private sector uh, uh, firms because uh, higher income uh, give you more than just more consumption good, but improved chance of, of uh, finding, finding a wife, either for you or for your, for your, uh, for your son. So, but that has changed uh, uh, as well. So relaxation of family uh, planning policy the last few years has moderated the sex ratio imbalance. I want to, I, I know, I, I know I'm uh, uh, running out of time, but I sh still should note that the sex ratio imbalance 
generated, generates extra growth, uh, but this extra growth does not bring more happiness. So, so it's not uh, uh, a growth that you know, me as a former chief economist of the Development Bank would ask country to do, because it, it does not improve your happiness. But still, it raises, uh, uh, raises growth rate, uh, uh, and, and the moderation of sex ratio imbalance uh, would also make this force uh, less uh, powerful. These are structural factors. Now, um, when the converging stories uh, is a separate from demographic uh, story, so as country becomes richer, growth rate uh, comes uh, down uh, globally. Now, um, these two converging story and demographic story do not have go together. Some country grow slow down because of aging problem, because of demographic challenges. Other country grow slow down because it has gone, become richer. In the Chinese case, these two forces have happened to uh, 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 be operating uh, simultaneously. So, so, so the growth slowdown uh, is more challenging in the Chinese case than in other, uh, other countries. Solution, well, you can relax family planning policy uh, is one way to do this. But that's not so, so China has started to allow more children uh, to be born. So formally, the, now the policy is two-child policy, that every family should have two children. Perhaps soon they're going to, the policy will change to every family will be required to have two children. Not there yet. But, but the, this policy, so, so, the, so you can see progressively family planning policy will be uh, uh, relaxed. This change, I should note, in the next two decades will make growth rate worse rather than better. Why? Because no, child, no family and no government official have figured out how to give birth to a 20-year-old right away. You always give birth to a baby. So for 20 years or so, the, the, you, have, you, you raise the dependence ratio without increasing working age, size of working age uh, cohort. So, so relaxation of family planning policy for a period of time will make growth rates worse rather than better. But afterwards, it will help. If you never relax family planning policy because you'll always be in a terrible demographic uh, fe uh, features. So that doesn't help. So ultimately, the source of growth has to come from productivity increase, including innovation. So ultimately, you cannot count on adding more people to it. You have to count on improving the smartness of the workforce or uh, productivity of the work, workforce, including innovation. So innovation is important for two reasons. One is source of productivity growth, but the other is it also has a direct bearing on U.S.-China uh, frictions. Like, you know, like we, we said that uh, one of the U.S. complaints is about weak intellectual property rights protection. With uh, more domestic innovation, there will be more domestic lobbying for stronger intellectual property rights protection, and you're going to have naturally end up with better intellectual property rights protection. So innovation is important for that reason, for these two reasons. Now, um, can Chinese firm innovate? If you want to find reasons to say no, you can find them very easily. There, there are plenty of us, there's no shortage of the story about how Chinese firms are just not very cre creative. You can also find stories how supposedly uh, uh, ch students in Chinese classroom are not particularly uh, creative. On the other hand, if you, want, if you want to look for more optimistic examples, you can find them too. There are plenty of Chinese firms are very uh, 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 innovative. Uh, uh, you know, how many of you have WeChat in your, in your, in your phone? So WeChat you know, that shows uh, Tencent is an extremely innovative uh, uh, company. Uh, you know, many of the functions now we have in the US was first pioneered uh, by, uh, by uh, WeChat. And DJI is another company uh, that, that produces uh, con the top selling consumer drones uh, 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 Go, uh, globally, and U.S. is now trying to put restrictions on um, power supplies to DJI and, and Huawei as, uh, as well. So Huawei not only uh, holds a lot of patents in China, Huawei holds a lot of patents in the U.S. and Europe as well. So now uh, Senator Mark Rubio uh, uh, in the U.S. Is, is proposing a new legislation that will essentially expropriate intellectual property rights of Huawei. So we'll say that you know, whatever patents Huawei has, will not be recognized by U.S. courts so that other U.S. companies should feel free to expropriate those property rights. 
it's just currently it's one senator's proposal. Uh, we hope that uh, uh, it will not become a law because it will be terrible, not just for U.S. reputation, it will be uh, uh, terrible for the in entire global uh, uh, intellectual property rights uh, 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 regime. But Huawei, in fact, is an example of another very innovative uh, private sector uh, private sector companies. But these are just examples. What do systematic data say? Okay. Now, um, you, and, and, and you can look at systematic data in, in, in multiple ways. One is to look, let's start with input into innovation, research and development expenditure uh, in the economy. Now, of course, larger country will have more of everything. So you have to look at the research and development expenditure scale by a country's size. So how does R&D as a share of GDP do uh, for China compared to uh, other countries? So I'm going to uh, show you, uh, summarize the idea in, uh, in the following graph. On this graph, there are two messages. So let's start with the blue line. What the blue line uh, does is to look at relationship between a country's income level or stage of development on the, ho on the horizontal axis with the country's investment in R&D as a share of GDP. Uh, this is in 2014. So you see a very strong positive association between the two. Richer countries tend to, uh, tend to invest more in R&D. Why do they do that? For two reasons. One is R&D is expensive. As a country becomes richer, you, can more, you are more able to afford uh, investing in innovation. Number two, uh, as a country becomes richer, the necessity to, inno to invest in innovation also grows. When you are poor, you can compete with other countries based on low wage. When you are rich, that option is no longer there. You can only compete with other countries when you have new, no, new ideas or new products to uh, sell. Both reasons suggest as a country grows richer, R&D goes up. So that's, and data suggests that's indeed the case. That's what Blue Line says. What's this line? The, Black dots with, red, uh, with the red line. The, the red line summarizes the time series pattern of Chinese R&D uh, investment as a share of Chinese GDP from 1995 to 2014. So in 1995, much lower ratio. Over time, as Chinese income level rises, its R&D investment as a share of GDP goes up. R&D investment certainly goes up a lot but not just because GDP goes up a lot. But even relative to GDP, it goes up more than, this, more than proportionally than GDP. So it goes up uh, as GDP goes up, similar to international pattern. Except the rate of growth for China is faster than what international average experience suggests. So, so in other words, if you look at the input into uh, innovation, certainly uh, Chinese firms collectively uh, spend increasing share of the output on, on, uh, on uh, innovation and more so than international average experience. By now, uh, Chinese uh, IND expenditure as a share of GDP is above OECD median and OECD average. Of course, top spenders are rich countries. If the top spenders are Korea, Israel, followed by Japan, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and so on. So, so Chinese IND expenditure are much lower than those countries as a share of GDP. But, but higher than an average uh, uh, rich country. So, 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 far, so judging from the input side, China seems to be doing well. But that's the input side. Uh, what about results? What about, uh, you know, what, what about results? Do you, the, does the higher uh, expenditure get you more, more, more innovation or not? Well, uh, you look at the uh, pattern application as one form of uh, innovation outcome. It turns out Chinese pattern firms, pattern application and pattern approval has grown exponentially. So much so that now Chinese firms collectively every year got, get more pattern than firms from any other countries in the world, including US. US uh, used to be the top uh, uh, pattern recipient country in the world. And China has surpassed that. Now, of course, skeptics will say, but what about the quality of the pattern? Is one Chinese pattern worth the same as one US pattern? Perhaps not. I consulted the pattern lawyers. They said, perhaps not. Chinese, 
since Chinese government uh, gives a uh, cash grant to support patent, firm may have incentive to maximize the number of patents. And one evidence of this is, is that some Chinese pat firms have to apply patents at home, and they also go to US and UK to apply for patents. When they go to US, they also often bundles two patents, two Chinese patents, sometimes three Chinese patents into one uh, and apply for US patent. So perhaps, therefore, you know, one way to think about this is perhaps the Chinese total number of patents should be, should be divided by one, 2.5, and they become more comparable to the US. If you do that, the total number of patents Chinese firm receive will be less than US firm. So US will still be the top recipient of patents. But China is a poorer country, so poor countries, uh, you know, ch uh, Chinese income uh, is about one-fifth of the US. So naturally, you should, should expect to see uh, less uh, uh, patent. But if you look at the growth, rate, even if you divided the all the Chinese patents by 2.5, you still see a very sharp growth rate. So innovation is growing. But people say maybe dividing, two point dividing by 2.5 in every year may, may not be the right thing to do. Perhaps you know, the, the, the quality deteriorates over time. Right? Could, in that case, you, you want to divide the Chinese patent by ever larger numbers. But then it becomes you know, a, 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 a uh, empty uh, debate. Right? So that's not a very productive way to think about this. So is there other way to do the adjustment? Well, the answer is yes. It turns out, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the US patents, not only US firms apply for US patents, firms from China and many other countries also apply for US patents, because US is a very large country. So you can do the following things. So it turns out, so, so, so look at you know, what kind of country whose firm will get a lot of patents in the US. Two things are most important. One is income level, the other is size of a country. Richer country tend to get more patents per person. Size of country also matter. Bigger country get more patents. Bigger country get more of everything, right? So once you adjust for size of a country, US patent tends to rise with, with uh, income level. So on this graph, what I, what I do is, I, so I have a number of US patents received by Chinese firm over time from uh, 1995 to now. And then I have similar picture for other, uh, other uh, countries. So two messages. One, across country, very naturally, as a country become richer after adjusting for size effect, country size effect. As country becomes richer, you tend to ex you expect to see more U.S. patents granted to firms from those countries, and and Ch same thing is true for China. As China becomes richer, it gets more U.S. patents. Moreover, relative to in international norm, if you think of Japan, Germany, Korea, Brazil, S South Africa, you know, large G20 country collectively form uh, you know international norm. Uh, Chinese. Uh, U.S. patent granted to U, uh, Chinese firm, in fact, growing faster than what this norm suggests. It seems to stay above the norm. So Chinese firm actually, you know, in, in terms of absolute U.S. patent, they don't. They, they are other countries are doing better. In terms of international average experience for country at the comparable income level, Chinese firm actually doing very well. So this suggests uh, that the uh, rate of innovation growth seems to be uh, real. You can also look at, beyond number of U.S. patents, you can also look at citation of U.S. patents granted to Chinese firms. So citation is a sign that other firms think your patent is useful, otherwise they won't cite you. Right? So for every U.S. patent, you can trace in subsequent years how many other firms in their patent application will cite your patent. That's called forward citation. If you look at the growth of a forward citation by uh, U.S. patent given to Chinese firm, they actually grow extremely well over time and better than international norm. This also, this also confirms uh, the inference that innovation by Chinese firm has been growing very fast. I want to uh, end this discussion by showing this graph. However, it's important to note that Chinese uh, public support system for innovation uh, is very problematic. First, let me note that public support for innovation, so-called government subsidy, uh, potentially is socially beneficial because uh, innovation uh, is, has what economists call positive externalities. Uh, uh, whoever uh, makes the innovation, 
the benefits goes way beyond uh, the innovator, and the innovator's private gain may be smaller than the societal's gain. That's why most countries in the world, including UK government, US government, and other governments, subsidize private sector innovation. So subsidizing innovation per se, uh, unlike subsidizing steel companies who are, need not be uh, a bad uh, thing. But if you look at the where Chinese subsidy for innovation goes, you will see very interesting patterns. So what, on this graph, what I do uh, is this. So, so, so f um, I look at first on the vertical axis, I look at how much patents firm can, for every million Chinese currency investment in R&D, how much patent you will get, how much you can convert a million RMB investment into patents, outcome innovation. And then uh, for, uh, you, can, you can sort all firms based on its relative size into 10 size buckets. What you find is on average, larger country, larger firms are less efficient in converting R&D uh, into, into patents. So, 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 so patent uh, R&D ratio tends to decline uh, as firm becomes larger, okay? Then I have three lines here. They, are, they correspond to uh, red line is foreign investor firms in China, blue line is private sector firms in China, and green line is state-owned firms. So for every type of firm, uh, larger firm do worse than smaller firm in terms of uh, ability to convert R&D expenditure into, into patents. But across all size buckets, stay on, well, most of the size buckets, stay-owned firms do worse. So stay-owned firms are especially inefficient uh, in, in converting R&D expenditure into innovation outcome. And yet you look at the government subsidy to innovation, most of subsidies go to stay-owned firms. So previously, we spent some time discussing, uh, reaching the conclusion that, in fact, Chinese firms think rate of innovation is okay relative to the international norm. Once the you know, labor cost becomes high enough, income becomes high enough, Chinese firm can rise to a challenge, become more innovative. Now we're seeing, in terms of uh, society's support for innovation, there's a massive amount of resource misallocation. Most of the support goes to sale firms, but they are not doing as well as, as private sector firms. In other words, the same amount of public support if they can be reallocated, you, if you have a, a equal footing to firms of all ownership, uh, from all ownership, the society would have reached much more benefits uh, in terms of innovation uh, outcomes. So in other words, there's massive uh, room for, for uh, improvement. Last thing I want to discuss, part three, is about assessing policy choices uh, and uh, uh, consequences. China faces a choice, especially free, uh, uh, with uh, trade friction with the uh, US. Uh, China can choose to do more structural reforms uh, and pursuing greater uh, openness. So the you know, government likes to talk about supply side reforms. And by supply side reforms, they mean making the economy more efficient, uh, more uh, productive. And the latest rounds of uh, tax reform can be considered as one element of this. You can also have more uh, openness. Uh, in the latest example of uh, greater opening is is the Shanghai London stock market uh, connect. It's an example of, uh, of a greater financial openness. There are many other steps as well, but since we are in UK, has one particular measure of greater openness that has a UK connection. I thought I would mention this on this. But that's not the only way uh, China might go. Uh, it, it is it is actually conceptually possible that China can choose a different path. Indeed, there are people uh, on the internet and in the government advocating a different path of choosing to be more protectionist uh, at choosing uh, retrenchment in the name of a security. You know, things, you know, Huawei uh, and other companies are facing, uh, you know, U.S. government uh, um, restrictions on parts and components supply to Huawei. And Huawei seems to be vulnerable. Huawei founder says Huawei is going to suffer uh, 3.5 billion dollar loss due to U.S. restriction. One might conclude supply chain is very dangerous to Chinese national security. 
depending, you know, making your firm so depend and your economy so dependent on U, uh, U.S. and maybe other countries is very dangerous. And therefore, you should withdraw from global supply chains. That's a, that's a possible conclusion, and, and some people are indeed uh, uh, suggesting this. But those choices will lead to very different path, certainly for Chinese economy, and I, uh, and I think experience will tell us the second path will lead to lower growth rates, much le uh, less fast uh, improvement in living standard for, 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 for Chinese. But we're also, these different choices will also have different uh, consequences for United Kingdom, other European countries, uh, and the rest of the world. You know, whether you have two you know, disconnected, decoupled economy, two parallel system, and every other country has to choose uh, you know, which supply chain uh, you will integrate yourself into, or whether you have a common rule-based global, global system uh, that, that, that will maximize benefits for, for everyone. They will be very different. So in that sense, China's choices will have global consequences if, as well. I have 50 more slides there, but I'm not going to do that. So why don't I just stop here uh, first? So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or comments or criticisms. Professor Fee, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wei. That was a fabulous talk and got us thinking about very contemporary issues and orange elephants, which I thought was particularly good. But also the global supply chain and the political control over different elements of the supply chain, and also the effects, thinking more about Adam Smith, of uh, the political scene of, of people empathizing or having sympathy with people in different positions and maybe imagining themselves in those positions too to d different degrees and, and this effect in a, in, a, in a political world as well as in an economic and trading world. So I think your, your discussion was, was exemplary uh, in terms of political economy, which I thought was, was fabulous and, and very fitting for, for Adam Smith. Well, we have time for a few questions. Would anybody like to uh, pose a question for Professor Wei? Well, let me go back to these slides. Uh, first, I want to say uh, so Chinese uh, growth path is not preordained. That different choices will lead to different uh, uh, growth rate. Now, certainly, there are uh, people in the country who are nostalgic about former growth model. Ironically, uh, uh, President uh, Trump's uh, uh, trade war has made those pro-market poor liberalization, poor openness uh, people uh, feel less secure because th their views will look like, an, you, know, like you know, naive or, 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 or even un unpatriotic uh, in the current uh, uh, context. So, I, I, so ironically that, uh, that uh, um, uh, Trump's policy, there's a self-fulfilling self uh, expectation prospect that, uh, that, uh, that uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's an increasing fraction of uh, people uh, in Chinese societies. So most Chinese, you know, stu and stu and stu many stu Chinese students can attest, most people in China do not grow up hating US. In fact, America, most people admire US model very much. Uh, they think the US is the model to emulate in so many different areas. Ironically, the current uh, debate uh, um, might have the uh, impact of changing uh, that. If China did choose their path of, of retrenchment, uh, uh, decoupling and disconnect. I think uh, the probability that China will become number one economy in one decade declines. So, so, so in that sense, it's not. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if China, its current go uh, government uh, 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 insists that it wants to maintain globalization, defend globalization, pursue more structural uh, reforms, if China continues on that path, I think uh, 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 then. Uh, you know, the chance that, uh, you know, within a generation and probably within a decade uh, for China to surpass U.S. in absolute size, uh, you know, uh, it, it becomes a, a high, high probability uh, event. 
So those uh, cho choices better, so it's not automatic that China necessarily can, uh, can uh, uh, be a uh, number one economy. Other countries' view towards China and China's view towards other countries are also, uh, uh, also matter. You can certainly imagine a scenario in which uh, China will be isolated from the rest of the world and Chinese growth rate will, uh, will suffer a lot, not just you know, drop by 0.2%, but can drop by a bigger uh, amount. You know, that need not happen, especially if China chose the, uh, chose the first path. I was thinking about in relation to exchange rates, was this business about perhaps a, a, a Chinese man producing lots of parts relative to an American man producing lots of parts? And if the, the exchange rate was artificial, did this give the, the Chinese uh, an advantage in, in terms of producing these parts? Right. So, on, on the exchange rate, when it was very popular to say that Chinese exchange was substantially undervalued and, and that's why China ran a large surplus, I pursued a, a number of research and a number of publications to point out that kind of thinking is, is, not, is perhaps uh, uh, overly simplistic. That, so for example, uh, you know, when we go back to the uh, sex ratio imbalance uh, uh, point, uh, sex ratio imbalance is one of the reasons for China country to have high savings rate. Uh, imperfect social security system and others can also boost uh, uh, savings. High savings countries uh, often can give you an appearance of undervalued undervalue real exchange rate relative to a model that does not take that into account. I look at all the, the, the models that you know, IMF has six models to assess uh, you know, the equilibrium value of, uh, of uh, exchange rate. Uh, you know, even though you use more than one model, there's no guarantee that any of the model is, is right. So, so, so the, the exchange rate, the uh, equilibrium exchange rate models, if you use a misspecified set of models, you can reach wrong conclusions. So I say, say if we, do not, if we uh, did not correctly understand why China had a high savings rate, you could mis mistakenly conclude that China had an uh, undervalued exchange rate. At the same time, of course, I, 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 I has always been a consistent uh, a proponent for China to have a more flexible exchange rate. It's just that my prediction was, if China had more flexible exchange rate, we would not, uh, in fact, see massive appreciation of Chinese currency. That's, that was my prediction. I don't, so, but of course, now we have passed that stage, right? so it's hard to go back and do the, do the experiment. But today, ironically, I think one of the problems China has, I didn't spend time discussing exchange rate, is that Chinese exchange rate is overvalued for about two and a half uh, years uh, 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 at least. If you let exchange rate to be completely determined by, by the market, ex Chinese exchange rate is very likely to become weaker rather than uh, uh, stronger. And, and, and China, the, uh, the central bank puts a lot of eff uh, effort to make Chinese exchange rate overvalued, partly due to negotiation with the US. When US uh, officials come to China, on exchange rate, it has three re uh, requests. Number one, let market determine your exchange rate. Number two, do not appreciate, uh, don't, sorry, do not depreciate. And number three, if the two conflict, forget about the first one, just do not depreciate. That's essentially the US, uh, the, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm character, you know, character, give you the character of the discussion, but that's essentially the nature of the discussion. Therefore, when you look at the Chinese central bank uh, uh, exchange rate rule, it's a, it's a, the rule has a two parts. Right, so one part is essentially marketing means. You look at the previous day's close as your center, and then you do what's called, what they call the, I forget the technical name, essentially it's some adjustment, policy adjustment. In the last two years, the policy adjustment is always in the direction of the make, make the exchange rate more expensive than otherwise the case. In other words, when the market makes Chinese currency more expensive, the central bank will let it be. When market made exchange rate less expensive, Central bank, central bank counteract this by, the current, by, by making the currency to depreci, depreci, depreciate less than what the market wanted uh, to be. So I think uh, that's actually problematic. So part of the, uh, you know, you know, much of the slowdown is due to uh, intrinsic structural factors. Some is due to trade war, but a piece of it I think is due to overvalued uh, uh, exchange rate. So in fact, that's another reason for China, I think, uh, uh, for, for me to recommend uh, uh, to recommend China to go for 
much more flexible exchange rate. They just you know don't intervene, uh, don't intervene as much. And I think that today, what is likely to happen uh, is a decline in the value of a Chinese currency rather than a, a appreciation. Join me in thanking Professor Wei for the excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.